Hey guys, my name is Nicole Deer and I am a PhD student at the University of Houston. I'm working with the Heritage Society at Sam Houston Park to bring you guys a little bit about Bagby Street's history. First off, I would just like to acknowledge a few people who made this project possible. Of course, Anna Trejo at the Heritage Society has been my main point of contact and she's been awesome about helping me. Um, the University of Houston's um, Humanities Lab done by Dr. Josiah Rector and Dr. Leandro Zarnow um, have been um, a huge facilitator of this project. And of course, Lainey Chavez at the Harris County Archives has been amazing to work with in helping me get some primary resources. So thank you to all of those people and everyone else who has helped make this project possible. Uh, so we have quite a bit of content to go through today, so I'm going to try and go as quickly as I can. Um, but I hope you guys enjoy. So first off, we're going to do just a general historical overview of Bagby Street and um, what buildings were there, what we know about Bagby Street, and then we'll do a deeper dive later on into um, the county jail that was on Bagby Street and figure out what we can learn about Houston based off of one of these buildings that we're going to talk about. So our first uh, little period that we're going to talk about, I've named the Wild West, um, 1836 to 1845. We have the Republic of Texas. Bagby Street does indeed exist, but is not named. And Obedience Smith was a settler who um, had her cabin built by her son, Ben Fort Smith, um, on the west side of Bagby Street. And there's actually an uh, in-depth book on Obedience Smith by Audrey Barrett Cook, if any of y'all are interested. Um, and then in 1837, we have Houston is officially founded by the Allen Brothers. Um, there is a historical marker for this on Bagby Street, if you want to look for that. And uh, between 1837 and 1839, it was the capital of Texas under Sam Houston. And they actually named the city Houston before it was ever the capital, um, just to essentially bring attention to Houston, and it worked. From 1845 to 1877, I'm calling this Rocky Foundations because we have a lot going on here. Um, we have the annex annexation of Texas into uh, the United States, and then shortly following, we've got the Civil War and then the Reconstruction period where we kind of figure out how to be a nation again after all of that turmoil. So naturally, there's not a ton going on as far as recording what is going on on Bagby Street because we've got much bigger problems going on. But in our next period, um, we have uh, the beginnings of what, you know, Bagby Street is as a, you know, true street and part of downtown Houston. Um, so it is recorded on the Sanborn maps of 1885 and 1890. You can find these um, uh, at UT's um, library. And there, you don't have any zoom in though, so we don't know exactly what buildings were there, but it, we do know that it exists and has a name at this point. Also during this period, um, specifically in 1879, Antioch Missionary Baptist Church was built. Um, it was created um, as the first and oldest Black Baptist Church in Houston with some Gothic architecture and a tower and stained glass windows, truly beautiful. Um, and this was done by uh, Jack Yates, the first minister. He was a former slave real estate investor and alderman of Houston. So that is a particularly important site for Bagby Street. Um, it is on the National Register for Historic Places. So, you know, this is a, a particularly important spot for, for all of the nation as well. In 1896, um, we have another set of Sanborn maps that ha gives us, um, you know, our first details of what Bagby Street would have looked like in the 19th century, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, I've got a few things underlined in red to, that I wanted to point out. First of all, Bagby Street was not paved, so, you know, be thankful for, for you know, pavement. Nowadays, it makes it much easier to travel on, less muddy, all of that kind of thing. 
Um, and then also we have um, a couple, you know, dwellings here. All, all the little Ds that you see on the um, buildings are, you know, designating it as a dwelling. That's somebody's house. Um, there are a few designations. Um, so on here you do see a Negro dwelling. So we know there was um, a, you know, large black community in this area. Um, also, you can't see it on this particular screenshot, um, but there was another area that was labeled as female boarding, so um, that's particularly interesting as well. Um, there is a little S in the top right corner there that's designating that building as a store, so there are also a couple stores here as well, um, and one in particular um, at San Felipe uh, was designating it as a tin shop. So also during this time, we get our first mention of the um, county jail as it was um, built in 1896 as well. So they are pretty on the spot with that. Um, it, right now it is um, on the site of where the Stanley Oak is, if you know where that is on Bagby Street. Um, it's uh, at Capitol Street, essentially. Um, but off of this, you can see that there were, you know, cell holdings, there's a skylight, there's heaters in the, in the middle. Um, so they have quite a few details as these were, you know, fire insurance maps, basically. Um, so they wanted to, to, to see, you know, what was actually built there. Um, and then also um, on, on uh, later maps, we see that there were offices and a, a kitchen on the first floor. So uh, during this time, you know, we also get in 1899 City Park is founded. You may know it now as uh, Sam Houston Park, which is owned by um, the Heritage Society. Um, it was renamed to that in 1903, so pretty short, you know, period as uh, known as City Park. But um, during the 1800s, this area was actually used as the ox wagon uh, campgrounds for when people would come take their goods to market in Houston. Um, the, a part of this park also was the Episcopal Masonic uh, cemeteries, and you know, so this is this place has been you know a, a gathering place for quite a long time, which is pretty neat. Um, and then next off, you know, our next set of sandbar maps that we're able to get our hands on um, from 1907 has quite a few details, actually. Um, you see lots of developments from the 1896 to 1907 sandborn maps. So again, um, you know, Bagby is not paved still, um, but we have a few more, you know, things. Of course, we still have dwellings, um, mostly, you know, single family um, dwellings with, you know, a bit of a lot, you know, some of them have storage sheds, you can kind of see that in the top right bubble, um, you know, and then there's one that had, uh, you know, a, a building labeled as servants quarters, and there are a few that have some um, labeled with store, uh, stables. Um, also, you know, there's a, a carriage house in the, in that top right corner as well. Um, there are uh, a couple apartment buildings. You can see that in the bottom right corner. And there's a couple of vacant buildings, um, which is you know interesting that they felt the need to label those as vacant. There were a few stores. So in the top right corner again, you can see a carpenter shop, and then there's also a blacksmith that's in the bottom right bubble that you can see. Um, you can see City Park kind of in that background image a bit. It's a bit covered um, by, by the right bubble. Um, but that huge open section sort of in the, in the top portion of the um, map is City Park. So you do see that on there. And then, you know, there's a few just sort of open lots that don't really have anything on them. So our next sort of period um, really just marks a lot of growth um, in um, in, in uh, Bagby Street's history. So first off, we're going to look at the Houston Public Library. Um, this was originally built, or sorry, the, the library was officially founded in 1904, um, and Julia Bedford Ideson was the first librarian for the city. Um, and so her building, I call it her building because the Houston Public Library was um, named after her um, in 1951. 
Um, so, so the building was renamed and it had um, Spanish Renaissance architecture and um, the coolest part, to me at least, <laughs> um, is that it was built on the Thomas Bagby home site. Um, so, you know, we're having now things sort of taking over older parts of this history already um, in the early 20th century. Uh, next off, we have the Ancient Order of Pilgrims building. Um, this was honestly an amazing um, source and place of um, Black culture, history, community, all on Bagby Street. So the organization was started in 1882 by Henry Cohen Hardy, um, who was a Jamaican immigrant, but the this particular building was not built until 1926. Um, and this was the headquarters for the entire organization, which had multiple chapters nationwide. Um, the architect is Alfred Finn, and it had four stories, was brick, triangle shaped, which you can kind of see in that image, and it also had a rooftop garden, auditorium, and ballroom. So this was um, specifically a civic center for African Americans um, to sort of gather in the face of Jim Crow laws um, so that they could help each other as a community. Um, this organization helped provide burial insurance, life insurance, real estate loans, uh, loans to individuals in distress, and community project funds. So it, it really did quite a bit financially, um, but it also provided a space for different services. So the Houston Negro Chamber of Commerce was here, the local Indo Double ACP chapter was here, Girl Scouts, YMCA, and there were also offices for doctors, attorneys, um, a pharmacy, and some other stores in here. So there was quite a bit packed in there. Um, in 1931, the order actually closed, um, but in the next year, the Progressive Order of Pilgrims was opened by G.A. Kennedy. So essentially, um, this community member really wanted to, you know, try and make this organization continue to, you know, serve the community. In 1941, the Franklin Beauty School moved in so um, people could learn and, uh, you know, get jobs that way. And then, you know, it's kind of a travesty, but in the early 1960s, um, this building was demolished. Um, and so there's not, you know, too much, you know, left of it now. Um, but there is a historical marker that was put up in 2006. So if you're walking on Bagby, uh, make sure to look out for that. In 1927, the Harris County um, Jail was replaced. Um, so it was replaced on the same site, which was 624 Bagby Street. And it was designed by Wyatt C. Hendrick. This one was designed with eight stories in the Greek classic style. And there's records saying that prisoners were kept on the fourth floor, um, the insane were kept on the fifth floor, and there was a chapel and exercise room on the eighth floor. So it's kind of interesting because they really expand there, um, which also sort of reflects, you know, the growing um, aspect of Houston in this particular time period. The other thing um, that I wanted to look at was um, Sam Houston Hall. Um, this is particularly, um, you know, interesting as a, a, a historical spot because the 1928 Democratic National Convention was held here. Um, Jesse H. Jones paid for the bid that won Houston um, this honor. And he was, you know, a pretty prominent local businessman. So he had quite a bit of cash apparently to, to spend on that. And this was particularly important to him and to Houston. Um, and it was particularly significant because this was the first um, Democratic National Convention to be held in, you know, any part of the South since the Civil War. So um, this really shows, you know, how long it took to sort of start mending, you know, as a, a nation. Um, at this um, convention, they nominated um, the, you know, New York Governor Alfred E. Smith for president and Senate Majority Leader Joseph T. Robinson uh, for his vice president pick. And later in the, you know, the actual election, uh, these guys were uh, defeated by Herbert, Herbert Hoover. 
um, who we know, um, you know, gets is the namesake for Hoovervilles during um, the you know 1930s and the Great Depression. So it's interesting how um, history kind of you know takes different turns that way. Um, but there, you know, is also a historical marker for this as well if you want to look out for that. So our next little section is Houston's New Deal. So kind of what comes along with the New Deal, but also sort of trying to push through um, World War II as well. Um, first off, we want to look at Sam Houston Coliseum and Music Hall. Um, some of y'all who have been in Houston for a while may remember this building. Um, this was a space in which um, different conferences, conventions, um, different um, concerts, sorry, I forgot the word, um, were, were held here. Um, so it was a, a massive gathering space for Houston as, as a, a city. Um, and this was also designed um, by Alfred Finn. Um, in 1939, so only a couple years after it was built, it held the National Flower Show set design. Um, but the real historical gem here is the 1977 National Women's Conference. So this was held from November 18th to the 21st of 1977 and was the first large scale public gathering of women since the Women's Rights Convention in 1848. So it had been quite a bit since women had gathered um, to discuss, you know, in, in a large scale public way, their rights within the US. Um, and so the main uh, point of this conference was, of course, to address women's rights, and they ended up producing the National Plan of Action pamphlet. And this pamphlet influenced President Carter to establish the National Advisory Committee for Women. Um, so this is a really, you know, interesting, fascinating conference. Um, one of my professors, Dr. Zarnow, and another professor at UH, Dr. Young, are um, creating a massive um, website and database for this particular conference. So I encourage you guys to go check that out if you're interested. Um, they've done a ton of work on this. So there's also a historical marker for this on Bagby Street as well. And then next off, we're going to look at the Houston City Hall, which was um, built by the Public Works Administration um, during the Great Depression um, as, as part of, you know, uh, FDR's New Deal. And so this was built in 1939. Um, it was built with a reflecting pool um, originally and is a 10 story structure. You guys probably recognize this structure. And the stone relief on it is done by a man named Herring Co from Beaumont. Um, and it shows men uniting government to control the chaotic forces of nature. Uh, also, you may not know, but there is a time capsule placed in the cornerstone with a Bible, copies of the city charter, three daily uh, local newspapers, and the city auditor's report for 1937. So one day, hopefully we can kind of find that again and, um, you know, check that out because I'm sure that's pretty interesting. Um, it also was listed on the National Register for Historic Places in 1990. So a couple other things, um, you know, in uh, 1937, we had the Houston fire alarm uh, built and in 1939, Herman Square was built. So, um, you know, there's sort of more mundane things that are going on with the New Deal as well, but, you know, also, you know, extremely important. So I've kind of grouped the second half of the 20th century um, as cultivating consumerism. This is really where we get a lot of um, sort of, yeah, like stores, um, public places being put in much more so than those dwellings that we saw um, right at the, you know, the turn of the century from uh, 19th to 20th century. So, you know, we've got a Cadillac um, resale place that was built in uh, 1969. Um, the One Allen Center was built in 1970, Bayou Place in 1991, and Hobby Center for the Performing Arts was built in 1998, um, which is actually on the site where the Sam Houston Coliseum and Music Hall was. So since 2000, 
Um, I've called this reflecting on our roots. There's been much more than this going on on Bagby Street since 2000. I mean, that's about two decades. Um, so there's been quite a bit, but I just wanted to kind of highlight, um, especially since this is a, you know, a history presentation, I wanted to highlight um, a couple places where you can kind of reflect on this history. Um, one is the George Bush Monument at Sesquicentennial Park in uh, 2004. Um, it, it's still there, um, but that's when it was put up. And um, it was really cool because in 2018, after uh, President Bush died, um, there was lots of people bringing flowers and, and gifts and all kinds of things to that statue to sort of, you know, commemorate his role in this nation, which was pretty neat. Um, and also, of course, the Heritage Society that is at Sam Houston Park um, or 1100 Bagby Street. Um, in Sam Houston Park, they have multiple historic homes that you can check out, get tours of, and they also have exhibits that they change out every now and then um, at their, um, their place. So um, I encourage you guys to go check that out. That out. Um, there's lots going on there. And now we are going to take a deep dive into the Harris County Criminal Courts and Jail. So this was here. Uh, from 1896 to 1926, and then of course you guys saw that it was replaced on the same site, but I want to look at this one in particular. So I really want to use this time to look at Houston from a new perspective um, and kind of look at a place that hasn't been looked at very much before and see what we can learn about Houston society and um, take a bit more of a, a humanistic perspective to sort of the legal system. Um, the criminal court was only here um, un up until sometime before 1912, so there, there weren't uh, trials being held here for the entire duration, but there were um, for a small portion of time. And um, after this particular jail was built, the old jail, which was not on Bagby Street, um, but that was used as the city lockup and also the police headquarters. So just as some historical background about law enforcement in Houston, um, by 19, or sorry, 1898, there were 24 marshals, and these marshals served as night watchmen and tax collectors. And they mainly um, patrolled Buffalo Bayou, Main Street, Texas, and Prairie Street. Um, and unfortunately, you know, during this time, there was quite a bit of prejudice against the black communities and immigrant communities that were um, coming to Houston. And because of this, um, black patrolmen were assigned to black neighborhoods um, to try and sort of keep them more safe, but also because of the segregation that was becoming much more prominent. Um, and so this was particularly tricky socially um, for these black patrolmen because they were not trusted by either the black community or their fellow patrolmen. Um, and also because there were only, I think, three black patrolmen for a population of like 14,000 um, in these particular communities, um, there obviously were not enough to, you know, adequately patrol these areas. And, you know, to try and make up for that, of course, they were using white patrolmen in these areas as well. Um, but the, these white patrolmen were often known for being particularly brutal compared to, um, you know, white patrolmen who were not in uh, minority communities. So, you know, there's there's a bit of history there um, that I think, you know, we can kind of relate to in this era where, you know, names like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and, you know, countless others are, you know, household names. Um, so I think, you know, we have a lot to learn here as well. Um, you know, and during this time period, there's also enormous growth of both the city and the police force. Um, so this growth of the police force was pretty unsustainable and made it extremely difficult to train and professionalize the police force. Um, they also had a lack of funding, so they didn't even have uniforms. Um, I also wanted to mention, though, the first female cop, Eva J. Bakker, um, who was white, um, was um, made 
a cop in 1918. So that's particularly interesting um, that we have in this, you know, time period um, where women, you know, may not have been seen as, you know, a force that could, uh, you know, be a part of the, the police force. Um, she mainly processed female prisoners and there actually were other women who were jail attendants. They just weren't um, policemen. And um, unfortunately, in 1928, so about 10 years after she started, um, she was fired by the new chief, essentially by him withholding her pay. So there was still, you know, room to grow there as well. And, um, you know, throughout the 1920s, there was a large KKK influence um, in the police force, but also within... Um, city council, um, which this tracks with other trends that we see around the country um, during this time period as well. I wanted to kind of show you guys what my um, research looks like, um, you know, sort of on the ground essentially. So I, you know, you guys can see what, you know, doing history looks like. Um, and this is where I worked with Lainey Chavez and she was able to pull, you know, a few samples for me to kind of look at of the um, JP criminal dockets. And so these dockets, um, you can kind of see the pile I looked at, you know, kind of the cover of one of them and like a, an example page from one of them. Um, but they, you know, kind of give a lot of information, um, you know, but it also depends on, you know, the case that you're looking at on how much information is given or not given. Um, but typically they'll give, you know, the name, date, whatever the crime is, um, the determination of, you know, guilty or not guilty, you know, if there was a fine, you know, how much that was, and sometimes other miscellaneous information, you know, like who they stole from or um, who they got in a fight with, um, what they stole, different things like that. So um, these dockets, I only pulled a sample, you know, of the time between 1896 to 1926. So, you know, these ones that you see in the picture on the left are 1896, 1899, 1905, 1907, 1911, 1917, 1922, and 1925. <laughs> so I looked at about 92 different cases um, that I just kind of sampled from, you know, each different docket to kind of get an idea of who was being arrested, what for, et cetera. But just so you guys know, I am not a data scientist and these you know, numbers that I'm gonna show you are not necessarily um, you know, representative. representative. Um, but I do think they can give you kind of a good idea of generally what's going on during this time period and at this jail. So let's look at an example. Um, this is actually the first one I ever read, um, and I thought that it was a pretty good example of what you could find. Um, so I just want to read this off to you guys so you can get an idea of what the language was like. So, the state of Texas versus Johnson Child's affidavit filed 12 day of November 1896. The defendant is charged as follows to wit. On or about the 12th day of November 1896 in the county of Harris and the state of Texas did fraudulently take from the possession of Charles Robinson one log of the value of eight dollars the same being the personal property of the said Charles Robinson without the consent of the said Charles Robinson and with the intent to deprive the said Charles Robinson of the value of the same and to appropriate it to the use and benefit of him, the said Johnson Childs. And then we go on to the bottom part here. On this, the 14th day of November, 1896, this cause came on to be heard. The state of Texas by E. H. Vasmer, the attorney appointed by the court to represent the state and the defendant announced ready for trial and the defendant demanded a preliminary examination. The court having heard the pleadings, evidence and arguments of counsel and being fully advised therein renders judgment and then and there bound the defendant over the criminal district court of Harris County, Texas, the next term thereof to be holden at the courthouse thereof on the 7th day of December, 1896, 
in the sum of $250 for his appearance before said court, in default of which the defendant is remanded to the custody of the sheriff of Harris County, Texas. It is so ordered, adjudged, and decreed by the court. W.B. Hull, Justice of the Peace, Harris County, Texas. So you guys can kind of see what this language looks like here. And, you know, it's also interesting that the defendant is also responsible for paying, you know, to be seen by the court, even though he has to be seen by the court. So it kind of gives you an idea of what, um, you know, the law system looks like, you know, in a real, you know, gritty sense here. I wanted to kind of show you guys what different, you know, crimes that I saw written in these texts and that um, I created different categories so that we can kind of look at them as a bigger picture and understand um, generally what is going on here. So I created this violent crime section, affray and assaults and murder is in there, uh, monetary crime, so burglary, uh, embezzlement, swindling, and theft um, all kind of have to do with a monetary sense. Um, Nonviolent crime is crime that's conducted but, you know, doesn't necessarily, you know, particularly hurt people, so disturbing the peace, indecent language, um, licensing issues, so there were a few people who were arrested for doing something without the, you know, particular license needed to do that, whether that's, you know, peddling or selling beer or something like that. And then um, we also have this uh, moral crime section in which we have uh, drunk and publicly drunk. So the difference there would be um, in the 1920s, we have the issue of prohibition where alcohol is no longer legal. Um, and so drunk would be um, during that time and publicly drunk would be um, any time before the 1920s, um, just like you would have today. And then we also have gaming, prostitution, and vagrancy, or homelessness. Um, and then there were also just a couple that were blank. They didn't write them down, so I have that as the unknown category. Um, this category, though, I think I, I'm not sure, but I would assume that maybe the, the charges were dropped or something happened and this didn't actually go all the way through, which is why they didn't finish filling out um, the affidavit. So I'm going to show you guys a couple different um, charts here. Again, you know, don't take these too, too literally since, you know, it was a sample size that was not necessarily conducted in the most, you know, uh, normal way for conducting data science. This is just to give you guys a general idea of what I saw in these dockets. So... I, I wanted to show you guys sort of the, the crime category by assumed sex, and um, what I mean by assumed sex is because they had the names in there and sometimes um, pronouns were used, I was able to figure out the sex of um, some but not all of um, the people listed in the dockets, which is why some of them, um, you know, there is an unknown category. Um, but this is just to kind of show you guys generally what kinds of crime were being committed, um, you know, first of all, and then also um, what, you know, males versus females were typically picked up for. Um, so we see moral crime is definitely the highest for both um, men and women. Um, and it's also interesting that monetary crime is usually conducted um, by men, or at least they're the ones being, um, you know, charged with that. Um, and then, you know, I, I wanted to point out that because, you know, the moral crimes were the ones, you know, that were the highest for um, all of our categories here, um, that morality is seems to be at least a particularly high concern for the public. This kind of tracks with um, this era being known as the Victorian age, in which, um, you know, purity culture makes a huge um, rise here. And so people are really concerned about, you know, how is society doing um, as, as a whole? 
Next, we're going to look at um, the crime category by the results, so whether they were determined guilty, not guilty, or bumped up to a higher court, which would be the, the Harris County Court here. Um, and mostly we find guilty, which, you know, is not extremely surprising. Um, but I wanted to point out that monetary crimes were mostly sent to a higher court which tells me that monetary crime is the most important one, legally speaking. Um, so people, um, or I guess not people, but the, the legal system really wanted to make sure that these monetary crimes were, you know, conducted in a sense that, you know, gave people the right to a jury, um, you know, that these trials were done fairly and wanted to take a much closer look than just having the JP look at them. So next we're going to look at result by assumed sex. This is um, actually a, a good <laughs> result in, in the way that we want to look at it in that there isn't actually too much difference between any of these categories, meaning that, you know, it wasn't like men were always seen as guilty and women were never seen as guilty or, you know, vice versa or something like that. Um, so this is what you would expect from, you know, a fair JP essentially. Um, so that's good information to sort of keep in mind here. Um, here we're going to look at the fine amounts um, by the crime category. So, you know, people who conducted, you know, violent crime versus monetary crime, etc. Um, you know, how much were those fines um, typically doled out by the JP? And so most fines were given for moral crimes, which kind of makes sense. Um, and, you know, there were never really any fines for monetary crimes. As you see, there's no green bars there. Um, and that is because, as we saw earlier, that the monetary crimes were being sent up to the higher court. So the JP was not doling out any sort of punishment because they were going on to a, higher, a, a trial, essentially. So here we're looking at the um, crime categories of jailed persons. So like I said earlier, there was a city lockup at the older jail that was not on Bagby Street after this one was built on Bagby Street. So when people would be picked up for things, they most likely would be taken to the city jail. And then if they needed to serve time because they um, couldn't pay a fine or because they were um, being held to go to the higher court, which would have been on Bagby Street um, for a, a good portion of this time, um, that is when um, they would be at the jail that was on Bagby Street. So this is who actually, you know, we know for a fact, you know, out of the people that I looked at, would have gone to um, the, the county jail on Bagby Street. So we see that um, about half the cases um, that I, I did look at were sent to the county jail. And most of these were monetary or moral crimes. This makes sense because, as I said, the monetary crimes were being sent to the higher court, which was at this jail for a good bit of time, um, or being held there until they could go to that court, even after that court was not um, held there. And also the moral um, crimes we see here because of people who couldn't pay the fines and therefore had to do time instead of um, paying the fine. We see um, a few violent crimes. This was probably um, the like couple cases that I saw that were murder related um, rather than, you know, affray or assault. And um, the nonviolent crimes that we see here also probably just couldn't pay whatever fine was doled out to them. I want to thank you guys for listening to this um, talk that I gave you guys. This is my bibliography. I encourage you guys to check out Bagby Street, look out for the, those historical markers, go see the Heritage Society and the different houses they have. They can give you um, really awesome tours on those. Um, and, you know, pay attention to what's going on around you in Houston. You know, one day this stuff will also be, you know, historical and may only be remembered by, you know, pictures or, you know, students like me looking up these, you know, um, these primary documents in archives. So, uh, 
you know, keep, keep looking into history, and thank you so much for listening. You guys have a good one. Bye.